The next treasure to leave behind is your library. All the books you have chosen, books well read, well underlined, with notes and observations and reflections you have written in the margin. The books that have helped shape your philosophy and the values of your life. That is a treasure, your library, and your listening library too. All these terrific cassettes, they are a treasure. The third treasure to leave behind is perhaps the most important, and that is your journals, containing all the ideas you have captured in your lifetime. Business ideas, social ideas, culture ideas, investment ideas, lifestyle ideas. Can you imagine the value these journals would have? They will certainly be more valuable to leave behind to your children than your couch. So get serious about your search for information and ideas and about leaving that information behind for future generations. Here is the next keyword for expanding your life for the better. That word is review. Go back over all your life experiences. Learn a skill called reflection, pondering life's events with the intent of learning. That is so important. I I call it running the tapes again. The events of your life are some of the best sources of information. Don't merely go through your days, get from your days. Be aware of what's going on around you so that you will drive the grooves in the record of that day deep into your consciousness. Here are some good times to reflect. First at the end of the day, take a few minutes and go back over your day. Where you went and what you did and what you said. What worked and what didn't. What do you want to do again? What do you want to correct? The colors, the sights, the sounds, the conversations the experiences. You see, experience can become commodity, currency, coin, an incredible source of value, but only if you take time to reflect on the experience and turn it into something of value. As we mentioned in our first fundamental, it's not what happens that makes the difference in how your life works out, but rather what you do about what happens. And part of doing something about what happens is this process of reflection, studying an event in order to glean valuable information from it. Another time to reflect is at the end of the week. Take a few hours. Take a half a day at the end of the month. Take a weekend at the end of the year. Reason? To make the past more valuable. Sophisticated people have learned how to gather up the past and invest it in the future. When my father was about to celebrate his 76th birthday, I said to him, Father, can you imagine what it's going to be like to gather up the last 75 years and invest them in your 76? That's how life can become productive and exciting. Not just living one more year, but gathering up the years and in investing them in the next one. By reflecting, you can gather up all the conversations you have ever had and invest all that you have learned and all that you have felt in the next conversation. Gather all your experiences and invest all that you have learned and felt in your next experience. And the more value, the more substance, the more information, the more wisdom you can gather from all of your yesterdays, the more exciting your future becomes. Probably all of us already know all that we need to know in order to make our lives turn out the way we want, except for one thing, how to gather what we've learned in order to invest it in what we want to become. So start a new discipline that can lead to wealth and happiness. Find out how things work. Never let it be said you didn't find out. Now let me give you a qualifying phrase. You may not be able to do all you find out, but make sure you find out all you can do. But when you're on the clock 24-7 and you don't have anybody who says you need to get away, they're not pouring water on your hand. Can I go just a little bit deep? Elijah follows Elijah through a lot of stuff, but what he gets from it is he finds per He finds the thing he was created to do. I want to talk to you who are in support ministry. I could do this all day, so I got to hear it. I want to talk to you, those of you who are up under support ministry. If you want to know what you're called to do, you can find what you're called to do by finding what you can't stand, because God will Will call you to work in the area of your greatest frustration. If you're called to the music ministry, you'll know the calling because you can't stand to hear music out of tune. And why is the why is the music too loud? And this is not up in the alto, they're not on key. And da, da 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 da. Your frustration about it expresses your passion for it. If you can't stand disorder, well, oh, the bulletins aren't planted correctly, and they didn't do this, and they should have done this, they should have done the other. The thing you can't stand is direction into what you are called to fix, not to complain about. Somebody ought to do something. You are the somebody they're waiting on. The reason you can't stand it is because you're called to fix it. We don't need complaints, we need solutions. You're passionate about it because you care about it. People who aren't called to music, we don't care how you sing or can't sing, it don't make no difference. Just do it and get on out the way. People who are called to it, they really care about it. The background, the background wasn't right. They didn't, they didn't EQ that up right. They need to do this.
this and they need to do that. That's the area you should work in, in the area that you care about, in the area that you care about. Because then it's not about the money and it's not about the pat on the back and it's not about the fish and the loaves. You find fulfillment in fixing what was frustrating, found this purpose. Elijah walked past him and said, oh God, Elijah, you need you need water on your hands. You, you, you need to serve in that area. You need to work in the area that you notice things that are missing and fix them. And he found his purpose. And one of the greatest things in life you can ever do in your whole life is find your purpose. And then the second thing that he runs into as he walks with Elijah, he finds his power. Because while he's working for Elijah back here in the kitchen where the cussing and the fighting and the spaghetti sauce is on the floor, he gets to see the power of what they do. He gets to see the power of it. And all of a sudden he discovers his power, his own power. And then he says, give me a double portion of your spirit. I want that. I want that stuff that you do and how you can do what you do like you do it when you do it. I'm connected to that. I want you to teach me how to make it do what it do, baby. But I was really listening to this young man. I met him backstage taking pictures. I didn't know he was what he was, but his insto- his story of how he used to, I was riding with the uh, CEO, Chris, from the airport. He was telling me this guy used to walk to work every day and he made it. Now he's a top team leader. So I can relate to we. I'm sorry, I didn't know him. I can relate to him. I've, I've been at every level. He said something back there. He said, I come from comfortable beginnings. And I stopped because I was backstage pacing. And I heard on the screen, I come from comfortable beginnings. And I stopped because who, who in here black come from comfortable beginnings? I don't come from comfortable. I come from the dirt. I come out of nothing. You looking at me today with all that I've accomplished because of faith. Now, when I talk to you today, I'm going to sprinkle faith in here because I can't talk to you about success without telling you about faith. You think, look look here now, you think for one minute you're going to make it without God, you tripping. You tripping, partner. You done lost your rabbit mind if you think that you're going to make it without God. Now, you can try it. You ain't going to make it. So when he said he comes from comfortable beginning, I'm here to tell you mine was a bit different. My father was a coal miner. My father made $5 a day with five kids. I'm the youngest of five. I got two older brothers. Well, I had two older brothers. My oldest brother passed. I got two older sisters. My youngest brother had a birthday uh, October 1st. My youngest brother 73 years old. I'm the baby of the family. <laughs> But I'm bowling. Uh. Jack Bogle, been in the business 63 years, showed up for 45 minutes, four hours later left his office. And afterwards he wrote a quote for it and he said it was the most probing, most intense interview you had in 63 years. Provocative and probing is what he said. Now that says to me a pretty cool thing. That means I engaged him better than anyone in 63 years and got those answers according to him, not according to me. Pretty cool. I went to a guy named Ray Dalio. How many know who Ray Dalio is in this room? Look how few people know Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio has been called the Da Vinci of investing. He's been called the Steve Jobs of investing. But most of you never hear of him because you couldn't access him in a million years. But if you're president of the United States, if you're head of the Fed, if you run China, you know who he is. And I'll tell you why. To work with Ray, first of all, for the last 23 years, he's made 21% per year compounded before fees through all those environments. Unbelievable. But here's all it takes to work with Ray. You need a $5 billion net worth and $100 million is the initial investment. And that was 10 years ago. Now he won't take your money no matter how rich you are. You're talking to him and he gets a phone call. It's the prime minister of China who wants some coaching. A large hedge fund might be 15 billion dollars. Ray's 160 billion dollars. I got hold of Ray. Part of what happened with Ray was he'd been a fan of mine, it turned out, for about 20 years. But what I did, I spent 15 hours to be ready to engage him. 15 hours of total immersion so I could pitch and catch with him. So I didn't just talk. I could do it back. He wouldn't just throw the ball. I could throw it back to him. And guess what? At the end, he has built something over the years called his all-weather fund, which is designed to make money no matter what market you're in. You don't have to know the markets. He said, what if I die? Someday I will. How my my kids have money? How will my phone throw areas have money. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to figure out why a balanced portfolio doesn't work in 2008 or 2000. And everything we've been taught about finance is wrong. And the Da Vinci of investing figured it out and has done it for himself for a decade and a half. And he tested it back to 1925 and it just makes money in any environment. So now his clients get to do it. Not the 1%, not the 0.0, the 0.001%. So I'm sitting out with Ray and I get him to explain how it works. And at the end, we're engaged three hours into it. He tells me how this works. And I said, this is beautiful, but I'm doing this. So I'm going to do for money, I'm giving all the money away. I want people to have the answers. And you just got done saying the average person going to the wealth manager will never work. They can't possibly do it. They might be sincere. They might even put their money in the same place they put you, but how many gold medals have they won? He said, those are the only people that win. There's only a few. It's a giant poker game with a few winners. So you just said they're not going to win with anybody else. So I said, this is worthless without knowing the exact recipe, how much 
in this? How much in that? How much money in this? Percentage, whether I got $1,000 or $20 million, $200 million. I said, Tony, that's, that's my secret sauce. That's what $5 billion and $100 million used to get you. I said, yeah, but you won't take anybody's money now. He said, yeah. And I said, you're giving away half your fortune with $14 billion. You're a giver. Help a guy out. Give me the secret sauce. Thank you. 